welcome to another session of our Guide for a No Hide study. My name is Abby, and with me on the screen is Andrew Overall and Jacob Scharf. And uh, in this series of videos, we're, we are reading and discussing this book, Guide for the Hide, Guide for a No Hide, written by Rabbi Michael Shlomo Baron. The book was designed to be a to be a help for Jews and non-Jews to learn the halakh details of the Noahide covenants, so that we can have practical guide on how to observe them in our lives. Uh, you can buy a copy online at the light at uh, the publisher's website, Lightcatchers, Lightcatcherbooks.com, or you can get the Kindle version like we have on the screen at Amazon.com. And uh, we invite you to study with us every week as we learn our obligations under the Noahide Covenant. Our plan is to keep these sessions under an hour. Um, we encourage you to take notes, write down your questions, comments, thoughts, and feel free to post them in the comments section online and we'll continue the discussion offline. Um, be sure to watch our previous episodes so you can catch up to where we are right uh, where we are starting tonight. And tonight, our reader is going to be Andrew, and he will get us kick-started. Let me just get the page here. All right. Okay. Anyway. okay. Thanks, Abby. Okay, so where we are uh, continuing in part one, section one, Torah, uh, that is uh, Torah tradition and the birthright, not a religion. And continuing on page two, uh, on the bottom paragraph, or third paragraph down. So, uh, continuing here. The nation of Israel, not called B'nai Noach, since they are entered into a distinct covenant with the Creator at Sinai, after Hashem delivered the nation from Egypt. Actually, this separation began rather with Israel's forefather, Abraham, who was sanctified with the additional commandment of circumcision according to the unique role of the nation that extends from him, the role of holy priests to minister to the other nations of the world. However, before the giving of the Torah at Sinai, the Hebrews had a halachic or legal status of noise. Fittingly, the Torah's account of their lives and deeds should be understood primarily in the context of the Noahide covenant. They are a perfect case study by which we can identify the behavior Hashem desires and demands of mankind, and the behavior He rejects and forbids, that which He rewards and that for which He admonishes and punishes. So, uh, I'd like to pause here and uh, just make a comment. We could uh, back up on the page there, Abby. Oh, sorry. Hold on. Yes. Okay. Right. Uh, so, uh, the section here, right, says uh, the account of the lives and deeds should be understood primarily in the context of the Noahide covenant. Okay, so even though the nation of Israel was on track by divine guidance and their own merit to become this nation to teach Torah to the world, there is still much. That we can learn from them, and just as we gain wisdom from our own fathers, our ancestors, and our own wise men among the nations throughout history, Israel, who can offer us, you could say, the prime example of how to live as proper human beings because they were faithful to the Creator, the one God. Well, the key to the key to keep in mind with this is that prior to the revelation of the Torah at Har Sinai, even though they had received a, a few extra mitzvahs, like uh, or mitzvot, mitzvot, uh, like circumcision, for example, they were primarily just obligated in the seven laws. So anything we see them doing before the revelation at Har Sinai, basically, was they were acting according to the Shavu Mitzvot. Mm -hmm. And we can see this very clearly in a number of cases. Um, the fact that, um, 
for example, the, the marriages of the patriarchs would have, in most cases, been forbidden if they had been Jewish. Um, what else? The case of Shechem, their, uh, the war that they took up against Shechem is, is filled with different applications of Noahide law. There's a kidnapping that they deal with. There's a corrupt court system that they encounter and how they end up dealing with that. There's them actually starting a war. I, there's a whole bunch of different things which are all related to the seven laws. Well, and they is actually the, um, the siblings, right? And their family. Right, right. Joseph and um, the actual patriarchs. Yeah. Right. The in fathers the case, of the 12 tribes. In the case of Shechem, okay, those who are familiar with it, I mean, it is true that it shows in the Torah that Yaakov or Jacob, the father, had criticized his sons, but it was not for what they did, but how they did it with, with the, the intent with which they uh, brought justice to Shechem. As uh, the oral law does relate, for the kind of crime that was done in Shechem, which was a bride kidnapping, which, by the way, is actually a practice that continues in some parts of the world to this day, where uh, a young man will actually kidnap a woman and then inform the, uh, the young girl's father and mother that he wants to take her for a bride, and there's nothing they can do about it, and they accept it. And that's the way it is in some parts of the world. But Not the whole so. problem that they were dealing with was the kidnapping, right? Not the, the kidnapping is what's forbidden under no high law. Well, Actually, right. what, what brings about the, the biggest part of the situation, I think, in Shechem has nothing to do with the kidnapping necessarily. It's the corrupt court system and the fact that the people of the city failed to be witnesses to a crime that they all saw. Mm -hmm. So they failed to execute judge justice properly. Maybe we could get into that, delve into that a little bit more when we get to that section. That right. Law. But that's the thing. If you if you know the details of the Shiva Miswa, of the seven laws, and you go and you start looking through the Torah prior to Har Sinai, prior to Mount Sinai, you it's just replete with examples like this. This is just one small story, and it's it has applied Noahide halacha all over it. And the whole Torah is like that. But I will add something, uh, add something else. Well, while it does, what do you say, go uh, outside what is actual halacha, there's the other side of it, which is mentioned later on uh, in God for the Noahide. And that is but hold on. I, what goes outside halacha? What, I don't understand. Oh, the example I was about to bring up uh, with uh, Abraham, right? Oh. Okay. Right. When he when he went to run to serve his guest, if you recall, uh, in Genesis, when Abraham says that he was sitting outside his tent in the heat of the day, and when soldiers had come, he ran to serve them. Now the lesson that's being taught there, what is one of hospitality, and uh, Chesed, what is called Chesed of kindness. And not only doing that, but noting that he ran to do this, this good deed. Now, well, without bearing off too far, you might wonder, okay, it doesn't seem like any uh, great trial, but as all tradition relates, he himself was uh, healing from his circumcision. Uh, but even then, even in that pain and recovering uh, in the heat, he saw so uh, wayfarers, okay, this is going across the desert, and he ran to serve them in absolute contradistinction to the neighboring peoples that, of that day, the Canaanites, specifically the Sodomites, who were known for doing the opposite. So you're saying that even things which are not necessarily like strict halakha in the Torah, there's like, there's cases where it's like, these are wise practices that it brings forth. That is right. And shows Actually, that. you could say that perhaps without taking too much time, but again, wanting to give an example here of seeing the lives of proto-Israelites in the context of the same, our same Noahide covenant, right? You can say the story's not complete without knowing 
the place where Abraham lived near uh, Sodom and Amorah, Sodom and Gomorrah, which really was known for oppressing the poor and wayfarers. As all tradition relates, they not only did not give charity, but they would punish anyone who did so or try to uh, give safe haven to those who were journeying from afar, which was a lot more dangerous in those days anyway, and those who were uh, poor, without food, without money. They go to the point of murdering them, or in the case of Lot, they were actually going to, to rape them. And right. as a well, let's, not, let's not get too in depth in any of these. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we don't need to give over the whole story. I'm sorry, uh, forgive me. The Torah is filled with these sorts of things. Yeah, I think the point is that the history of Israel did not start at Sinai. It actually started with Adam. As a, it started with Adam, continued through Noah, through Abraham, and then to Sinai. Is Up until then, they were just under the same covenant that we're trying to re rediscover in this age. And they're the only ones that has preserved it up until now. And because of that, I think, and we kind of talked about this in the first episode, the role that they have as priests and we have as, as lay nations. So how does that fit with, um, so we have the Noahide Covenant. Is the Jewish covenant inside of the Noahide Covenant? Is it considered separate? Is it, um, because they still, they're still obligated to seven laws in addition to what was given at Sinai. It's essentially, if you, if you study the sources, especially you can see this in the Mishnah Torah, in the, the Laws of Kings and Their Wars, chapter 9, if you read at the beginning, you can see how it basically was built on top of the seven laws. Really? Um, so you have sort of a continuing revelation that began with Adam, and he received six miswot. And then Noah came along and received the seventh. And then Avraham came along and received an eighth for just his children. And then it, it builds upon this until you get to the revelation at Har Sinai, where God basically recommands everything and sets it unchangeably and says, this is the way it now is permanently going forward. So at Sinai, even Moses, Moshe, was a Noahide up until he was under the seven laws up until uh, that point. That is correct. Okay. Which is actually an interesting thing to point out that the king of the prophets, the greatest prophet ever to have lived, up until the moment that he received his greatest prophecy, was basically a basically a Noahide. So, or as Mori or as Mori likes to say, a super Noahide because they had from Abraham until that point they had different had additional covenants besides the seven. Yeah, they had a few additional commandments, but super with no capes. Uh, yeah, I don't think he calls them super Noahides. I think it's. Um, Goy Kaddosh is the word he uses. They were Israel in potentia. In potentia. Okay. So, uh, we carry on? shall we continue? Please. Okay. Continuing on, meeting. Mm -hmm. We now see that, unlike Israel's covenant at Sinai, the Noahide covenant is not a religion that one must convert to, the people one must be accepted into. It is the divinely ordained legal, social, moral, and spiritual framework that non-Jewish human beings are born into, just as we are all born into a natural framework of physical laws and limitations. That fits in with the Torah tradition, that six of the seven laws were already given to Adam in the Garden of Eden. After the deluge, Hashem renewed the covenant and expanded it to include the new prohibition of meat taken from a living animal. Beyond the legal definition, it is a birthright, a free gift to anyone born into this world as the basic moral foundation for a life in harmony with the Creator 
and the people? I think this is a key thing that that makes this hard for a lot of people to grasp. I think um, when you become a when you when you want to embrace Christianity, you become a Christian, right? You go through a process and you become a Christian. If you want to embrace Islam, you go through a process and you become a Muslim. When you when you want to embrace Torah and Judaism, you don't need to become anything. You're just you. You were you before, you're you now. Nothing has changed. You're not anything different. You're just a human being who is now doing what is correct. That's the only difference. Well, I think there is one slight difference. So, well, going back to the Christianity thing, even when you're born to Christian parents, you still have to go through a rite of entry, like baptism and all that stuff. That's true. Um, the Noahide covenant, since you're already born into it, when you, since when you come back to it, all you're doing is you're basically like a Noahide Baal Shuba. Well, you already went through your rite of passage. You were right. being... You're just returning. You don't have to convert. There's no, there's no rite of passage except being born. So when you, it's like when Jews who are secular or non-observant become observant, which is what about Shushuva is, is they're, they're returning to their path and they're becoming observant in their laws. That's what we're trying to do, is become observant in our Noahide laws. Yes. Exactly. yes. We have to remind ourselves of this truth. And it goes back to Genesis. What does it say when God created humanity? It's created, uh, as it says in Hebrew, Salem Elohim, in the image of God, which really teaches that God had created humanity above all his other creations with the ability to choose freely, to distinguish between right and wrong, what is true and what is false, and to connect with the creator, even through prophetic knowledge as, as evidence with the way Adam and his wife or Eve related to their creator long before the giving of the Torah at Sinai. And it is something truly to and truly to meditate on that we're all created with, with a godly potential, even where we stand right now. In that way, why why add on any extra ritual to say, well, if you don't do this, you are not a godly person. I mean, what could be more godly than living a just life, as we'll learn from obeying these laws, and especially doing so with awareness of the Creator? Yeah, basically, following these laws are the key to bringing out our godly potential. To live, or to not necessarily bringing out, but rather to living up to our potential as human beings. In the life best of harmony, that we're capable of becoming. What's that? In life of harmony, it says. Yeah. Right yeah, they teach us. Yeah, that's true. There's basically uh, two major aspects. Or they teach us to live. They teach us how to perfect our relationships with God and with our fellow man. And you might also say with the world, with God's creation. And it makes sense because if you want to be, if you want to be on good terms with people, you don't kill them and you don't steal their stuff and you take care of their stuff. And when you find their stuff, you return it. All this is covered in the halakha, you know, it's the same thing too with, with the God. You don't insult God. You don't, you know, go cheat on God by being idolatrous and you don't, you know, you're, you're careful with creation, with this, what he gives you to eat. So here's a, here's a thing that, um, that a lot of people, well, yeah, that struggle with is that, okay, it says here, um, six laws were given to Adam in the garden, and the seventh was given to Noah. But six laws, there's nowhere, 
until you get to Sinai or with the Ten Commandments, there's no way or in Genesis with Adam that says, do not murder, do not steal, do not. So where does that, where does this list come from? Like, where does this teaching that six was given to Adam and seven to Noah, where does, where's that either in the Torah or in the oral tradition? I would say hold that thought and let's read the next section. And oh. then when we stop, let's discuss that. Since we haven't even gone through the list yet. Oh, we're just about to. But good question. Yes. Thanks, Andrew. <laughs> so, what are the laws? <clears throat> the Noahide Covenant is made of seven fundamental commandments, which are generally viewed as seven categories of law, containing other laws within them, and other laws that accompany them. The seven general commandments, mainly prohibitions, appear in the Talmudic literature under the following titles. So, did we mention, did we read them in Hebrew? Yeah, I read them in Hebrew and then also in English. Of course. Uh, I read them in English first and, well, either way. Either way. <clears throat> so, the first one, idolatry, uh, in Hebrew is known as Avodah Zarah, which literally means a foreign or strained service. And so we'll get to more when we get to that chapter. Cursing the name of God, also known as Birkat Hashem, which uh, literally means blessing the name. I wonder why that's not the opposite. It's out of reverence for the divine, not to put the Hebrew word cursing next to uh, next to Hashem. So out of rabbinic parlance, they said Birkat. But with the understanding, this refers to the prohibition of cursing the name of God. Next, murder or shvichot damin, shedding of blood. And then forbidden sexual relations or gilui arayot, which means reviewing nakedness. And something that is also learned along the way, both uh, in Torah literature and rabbinic literature, uh, the Figures of speech, uh, often at times, for the sake of modesty, right? Sometimes it's explicit and sometimes they use more modest speech. Uh, moving on. Theft, the Hebrew word for that is gazal. And eating meat taken from a living animal, also known in Hebrew as ever min hachai, or limb from a living animal. And then finally, justice, or in Hebrew, deen. And that is the one positive, the obligation to enforce all of the other laws. So, these are the seven. Mm -hmm. And... Um, What's on the next page? Or does it cut to a new paragraph then? Um, let me see here. The mine it cuts to new paragraph. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so, Abby, what was your question again? About what? About the seven laws. Oh, uh, I was just going to talk about that it's seven categories. And so I know in some places they say that there's like, there's discrepancies in the number, like there's 30, what, six or something, or sometimes 70, there are all kinds of different numbers. So how did the standard of seven come to be? And yeah. Let's there start. are different listings given. Generally the seven are the, the commonly understood main categories. Um, but the important thing to understand is that these categories are not to be understood as like strict, hard and fast. These are the categories and all must fit inside of these buckets. Rather, these are a, Hashem did not, as I was taught basically, Hashem did not command us seven specific miswot. Rather, these are a mnemonic device or a, an aid to memory that was created by the sages to to order and understand 
the entirety of the all of the concepts that fall into what we know as the Shiva Misur, the halakha that, that Hashem has commanded to non-Jews. To add to this, and this is partly to answer Abby's question from before of the sources, uh, that Hashem, and this to be clear, because I think it's not saying, what, the rabbis made it up? No, that's not what he said at all. Uh, again, what he said is that the making the categories was like, as he said, a mnemonic device because seven is a significant number uh, in Torah for a lot of reasons. And usually uh, the thing, the uh, trait that it brings to mind, of course, is completion, okay, like seven days in a week, okay. Um, yes. Now, the source for this, Hashem did command Adam through prophetic knowledge. And the source for this is actually found in Genesis when Hashem and then speaks to Adam uh, regarding you know, all everything in the garden, what he is permitted to eat and what he is forbidden to eat from, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But the way that the that the Lashon, okay, or the, the lingo is spoken in there. The categories are hinted at or are implicit uh, in that particular verse in Genesis. Well, this is true of, of all of the seven. The, the details of them and the, this information can be extracted from the text of the Torah, basically, um, in numerous different ways. Mm -hmm. But... But there's something else to keep in mind too, and this should be of benefit uh, for some uh, who already know, they know, and for those who are new, or you could say returning to this path, the path of relating to God in a very simple, humble way, that the, uh, that the tradition of Torah learning, that is uh, learning the ways of God, remember that this existed in all form before it was given over in written form at Mount Sinai. So it's understandable where people would say, well, we need to, we need to have our morality okay, anchored in the Bible or in the Torah. And it's true. It is ultimately the, so, uh, the source for this. Okay. Uh, however, again, like with these laws, okay, uh, they were given, they were given before the Torah was given. And how can I say, as Rambam himself pointed out in Mishnah Torah, and as we will see, that these are laws that can be understood rationally. In other words, it does not require divine revelation to understand the necessity and the rationality of all of these laws. Now, it, to some degree, it is like a matter of common sense. However, precision is absolutely necessary. And that's where the tradition of learning comes in that really goes all the way back to uh, Adam, back down to Moshe. Okay. I think um, okay. I remember Jacob pointed, Jacob pointed this out to me one time, which is that in the ideal world where we all know our all of the details of the seven laws, when we read the Torah and the stories in the Torah, they would just jump out of out, out at us. So imagine a, a, a you know imagine a time where the story of, of Adam and Abraham and you know the children of Israel before Sinai, where people were like, oh yeah, it's talking about theft, and oh yeah, it's talking about kidnapping, and oh you know, so you know, Bezrat Hashem that in you know maybe in my lifetime I hope that the knowledge of the seven laws would be so ubiquitous that we won't be like, well, why isn't it in the Torah? We'll be like, of course it's not, because it's obvious. Or it won't be, of course it's not. We'll be, well, it is in the Torah. It's right there. It's all over the Torah. It's all over, because we know exactly what we're, what we're looking at. Yeah, and as we, as we go through each of the seven in this book, we'll see, we'll see where some of these come from in the Torah, and we'll, we'll help point a lot of that out. Mm -hmm. 
And finally, before moving on, I mentioned the verse in Torah, okay, not to leave people hanging here. The verse specifically, uh, where I'm not mentioning this as the, as the ultimate primary source, but this is one of the main sources. Well, I don't know if I would get into that. It's, it requires so much elucidation, it's just going to confuse people. Well, here's the thing. I was only going Unless to be sitting here and elucidate it for like 15, 20 minutes. Well, that's not the point. I'm not going to elucidate it, but give a verse. I know, and that's the thing. If you don't, you're going to confuse people. Well, he, I think he should give the verse, and we could always talk about it offline because he did mention the verse. I think he should cite it. You know, yeah. I mean, you don't have to go into a long discussion, but I think it's good to cite it. I'm with Andy on that. It's just people are going to look at that and read it in English and go, that doesn't say anything. What are you talking about? So just keep that in mind. Well, it's something you can't elucidate from the English of it. You have to know, you have to look at the Hebrew and tear it apart in a very specific way and understand it. So. And perhaps it could come for another time. What? No, go ahead and go ahead and bring it forth. I just I was just warning people who are listening. Right. It. Okay. It's in Genesis in chapter two in verse sixteen uh, in English, okay, in our translation, it say, And Hashem God commanded the man saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. Now Again, for those used to English, okay, we're used to reading things, and as Amari would say, in a very plain Greek style. But certainly in the in the beginning accounts of Genesis in the Bereshit, the way that is written in Hebrew is a lot clearer. In itself, the text, when you learn it from from the Jewish perspective. It is a lot more dense and a lot deeper than what we learn in Sunday school, put it that way. And when you when you learn from a Torah scholar, you definitely come to appreciate it. It is true. Yes. Okay, shall we continue on in the book? Yes. Okay. Can we get through the end right here? Yeah, the okay. end of the section. Yeah. So the simplicity of this covenant is striking. It includes no religious ceremonies, requires no sacrificial service, no priestly hierarchy, equality between men and women, equality of all races and colors, a vision, what a world. It is the most basic code of human behavior that allows for a world United under the one and only king of the universe. Bidi, it is forbidden, according to Torah, for non-Jews to create any man-made religions. Why add to the simple perfection of Hashem's covenant? You shall not, as it says in Deuteronomy, you shall not add and you shall not subtract from it. In Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1. Just as with the rest of the Torah, adding it is subtracting it. The suffering and death in the name of man made religions should be enough of a proof to the wisdom of this prohibition. And I will say this uh, now, moving off the text and just adding a comment here that is certainly the challenge for, uh, for mankind, and that is simply to relate to the Creator without imposing our own imaginations of. What would be, what would be, what would you say most pleasing? And that is, if I may say, uh, using the religious impulse in the wrong direction. Okay. Again, speaking to the prohibition of creating rights in religion. Two things I may offer. I know that we're short on time. Let's see how well I can do this. Okay. Uh, now, as we're reading this week, uh, last week. In the Torah portion in Leviticus, was the right, count of this errors. This will be quite some time ago, not last week. Sorry, <laughs> it didn't happen last week. But there was a in the Jewish 
a weekly reading of the Torah portion as they go throughout the year, it, it came on uh, Leviticus, and that is uh, the sons of Aaron the high priest, Nadav and Avihu, when they brought in what was called Eshazara, or a, a strange substance, when they wanted to bring an offering to Hashem, and they were struck down for it. Now, that should really give us pause. Why? Did they not want to do something good? Well, the reason was given later because these men who were priests who had to set an example for the nation and also for the world that they made an offering that Hashem did not command. They're, they had no intention to worship an idol, but they wanted to create an extra right. Hashem in his wisdom decreed only what he decreed in terms of religious service that you must do this thing in that way at that time and so forth. No need to add to it. When they did, they knew better, then they were judged for that deed. And that is one example. Very harsh. Yes. The second example uh, is related by way of the oral tradition. And we will get into this uh, more later when we get into the laws of idolatry. But it must be known that idolatry, that is the worship of images, both physical and even abstract, okay, came into the world because of the invention of religious rites, but specifically for objects or things other than the creator. It was uh, the grandson of Adam. You recall the lineage that was Adam, his son was Sheth, and then his son was Enosh. The oral tradition in late said, in that time, these were men of great wisdom, but they made a great mistake in thinking that it is proper to give service and honor to the celestial bodies of the heavens. Why? Because they are part of the king's creations. Just as they thought, okay, this is to give honor to a king's servants, let's give honor to them. This is forbidden. This was known even from the beginning, but from that time that they started to give service to these objects as well as the Creator, then they began to create more false rites. Okay, and this is actually hinted at also in in Genesis in in uh, chapter four, which says that in those days to call upon the name of Hashem became profaned, the hint being that they were calling on the names of other gods, other deities who don't exist because they're not the creator. They're either creations or imaginations that came from these men's hearts. So going back here, okay, and that is the simplicity of following the path of the just, as we will learn in the examples of the righteous men and women of ancient times. I think this is something that um, a lot of people, especially um, coming out of a devoutly religious background, struggle with, is to how to strip away um, religious rights and not, I guess, um, tap, you know, kind of replace it with something else, whether it's in the tour or not. and and. I think it's just something people struggle with, so I'm not, I'm not sure how, how this will play out in a lot of people's minds because people don't see the sound laws as something that connects them to God for whatever reason. Here's the thing. The seven laws themselves are very simple. They're a basic framework of morality that's designed to be able to fit into any the, to fit into the culture and the, the, I guess, the existing expression of any given people, you know? So if you're like, you know, if you're a very primitive tribe living in, you know, caves hunting for your food, or if you're a people, like a very high-tech people living in a city with like, you know, technology and all this other stuff, the seven laws can fit into your life without requiring you to become Jewish, basically, without requiring you to give up your culture and your ethnicity and who you are and how you live. 
unless of course murder or theft is a core part of how you live. But in which case that's bad. In order to to be very ubiquitous, right? So that anyone can do them. Within that, they provide us a tremendous amount of freedom. So while they don't contain like specific religious ceremonies that we're obligated to do, and they don't contain, you know, specific ways that we have to to do these ritual things, we are free to express ourselves and to pray to God in whatever way touches our hearts and to, you know, do things like this as long as we don't, as we don't add to the Torah, meaning as long as we don't take these things and say, okay, I, for myself, I like to pray this way to God and I like to sing songs to him. That's fine. But if I take those things and I say, therefore, everyone else should do it this way too, because that is the way that God desires it, I've crossed a line. I have well, not added to God's Torah. And that's for you. a line even when you make it. And it's one thing to do it freely and as, as an expression, but it's a different thing to say, I am now obligating myself to do something I'm not, God does not yeah. obligate me to. Yeah, that too. If I, if I take those things and I say, this is the way that I like to serve Hashem right now. And therefore, this is incumbent upon me, and I must always do it this way. Then, yeah, I've also crossed that line, and I've added to God's Torah. A lot of and people have no high like, guilt about that stuff. It's almost like Catholic guilt, I hear. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I think, too, it's... Um, I think the way it's set up, it, like you said, it... it, it it crosses different cultures and different traditions. And the way I see it, and, that, and um, Rabbi Rowan brought this up in one of his classes, that we use the seven laws to elevate our existing peoples and our existing traditions and our existing cultures. And to use the seven laws to strip away the stuff that God doesn't desire and keep the stuff like charity is not incumbent upon us. But if we live in a society that's charitable, that's great. Yeah. And that's, right. that's part of the beauty of the seven laws, too. That what you brought forth there is that we, we are not supposed to throw away our cultures like garbage. You know, the, the people that we come from, the cultures that we've developed over thousands of years are beautiful and contain many, many wonderful things, even though there's like lots of garbage and idolatry and all this other stuff mixed into them, the seven laws help us sift that out and bring forth the beauty that we, that we possess as unique nations apart from Israel. You know, we don't have to become Jews. We don't have to become Israel to be unique and beautiful people. We already are that. I know, and the seven I mean, laws help, help us bring that out. That's our job as non-Jews, as Noahides, is to... Imagine if we, had all, if we all had to eat kugel forever. <laughs> <laughs> as delicious as kugel is, yes. <laughs> I also like lasagna. <laughs> <laughs> I like curry. And I like the music of my peoples. Yes. <laughs> But yeah, I think I think that's one of the hidden beauties of the seven laws is that it's for everybody in their time and in their place and in their people. And imagine the diversity of it's kind of you can see a microcosm of it among the Jewish people. They have uh, they all observe six hundred and thirteen commandments, and yet you have Ashkenazi tradition, you have the uh, Sephardi tradition, you have the Mizrahi tradition. It's, I mean, with 613, you still have all that diversity. Imagine what we could have with seven. Yeah. Oh, well, we already have with seven. We just have to clean up our act. I mean, what the Creator desires is diversity. And how do we know that? Because He created in the beginning from Noah and his sons, not one nation, but 70 from the beginning. It's so true. that kind of diversity which parallels uh, a saying uh, among the sages that there are 70 faces to the Torah. In other words, there are many different ways to interpret it without contradicting one another, okay, lest we 
go off into this uh, uh, you know, super liberal way of saying, well, uh, you can have a, a diversity of opinions that contradict one another. It doesn't matter. <laughs> See, again, uh, going back to what I referenced before in Genesis in chapter 2, the way the verse reads, in English at least, and probably other languages, uh, it reads plainly. However, in the original Hebrew, and with the and with the explanations and the oral Torah that accompany this, there is a great deal of depth to be learned from this. Uh, certainly, uh, even where we are, even if we don't know Hebrew, okay. But going back to the the whole aim of diversity here, but what I said in the beginning, and like I uh, I thought about it again, and thinking that came off perhaps too harsh and too, uh, maybe too rigid. The point is, as Jacob explained, is to bring out, I would say, like a, a nascent holiness that I think exists all throughout creation. But it's up to us to, uh, to bring that out. What, two sides of the same point, I think, whether they're bringing out potential or living up to it. But the point is that I don't know that I would say a nascent holiness, more like a nascent goodness might be more appropriate. Yes. So many pages to the tour. So. <laughs> so with that, maybe we should kind of end here and we'll, we'll, we'll start learning. We'll continue to learn more about what we are supposed to be obligated to do um, as Noah hides so we can achieve this beautiful vision for our people, wherever, whoever our people are and in our cultures and in our societies. Because I would like to see that in my lifetime where you don't have to stop people and be like, that's stealing and you shouldn't steal okay. any, you know. Stealing is my, my pet, um, my pet lot. I, I like that a lot. Well, I mean, to study it. You know how people specialize in different, um, they specialize in Shabbat or whatever. I, I want to specialize in theft and the laws of theft. That's cool. what that's me. But anyway. Here's why it's important. Before, before Hashem gave the laws of the holy tabernacle to the holy, uh, to the holy service before that, He gave the laws of justice. How can we come before Hashem? How can we come before the Creator? If we are doing wrong, if we're doing wrong to others, cheating and stealing and doing even worse. And anyone who's well versed in the prophets, it was something for which Israel was criticized. Again, there I go on my harsh track again. Yeah, you can't cheat steal and then say, Oh, I pray every day and therefore I'm a good person. It doesn't work that way. You can pray all day if you want, but if you steal and cheat, uh -uh. it's not right. how and such far, the more intricate than one would realize, but these are the means you know, by which a society can be peaceful or otherwise, God forbid. Great. Any last words? Was that our last words? Yeah. All right. Well, in that case, that uh, ends our study time this time. Thank you for joining us in this session of Guide for No Hide Study. Um, we hope you enjoyed it and that you learned something new. And uh, if you have any questions or comments, please put them in the comment section. We'll take the discussion offline, kind of respond there. And uh, we hope to see you again next time. Very good. Good week, everyone. May Sam bring you success in all your endeavors. Amen. Oh,